Um, so it's the last study of the study weekend. Half of our group has had to leave. So we have fewer uh, people on site to uh, Let's uh, try actually using my tongue properly. Uh, fewer people to participate on site here. So this might be if uh, any are willing or want to participate online that are on Zoom, uh, please do raise your hand. We'll try to, uh, there hasn't been much of any online participation yet this weekend. So this might be the one opportunity. Um, and of course our assigned topic uh, in this study weekend of firsts is uh, Jesus' first miracle. And that's universally, I think, understood to be when he changes the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. And which is kind of, if you think about it, it's a little unusual that that would be his first miracle. And if you read the account, which is found in John chapter 2, the Gospel of John chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, and it goes all the way through to verse 12. Now, uh, Vivian handed out some, what I'll call handouts, and really all they are, it's just the scriptures, uh, those 12 verses, plus all of the expanded biblical comments on those verses. Um, we have some other comments from other sources that we will try to fold in as well, some very interesting ones from different brethren who have given discourses over uh, the years, as well as others who have studied this. And it's, um, again, it, we get kind of circle back to the unusual nature of what you would expect Jesus, the Messiah, he's just arrived on the scene He's just been baptized, just gone through his 40 days uh, experience in the wilderness, and he's back on the scene now, and he's in Cana, which is uh, about 20 miles or so from Capernaum, and he's invited to go to this wedding. So what we'll do, uh, again, the biblical comments are meant sort of as uh, just a, a prompting for some thoughts that maybe you have, or maybe you haven't considered it. I don't know how in depth anyone here has, uh, or online has actually studied uh, this miracle that Jesus performed, but there are some notable characteristics of it and why as a first miracle, and it's said in verse 11, we'll read the whole account in a moment here, but it says this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So it's not a trivial miracle. It's not a trivial thing. And we think as, you know, uh, as Bible students that this is, there's more to this than meets the eye. This is more than just a simple happenstance that Jesus happened to be at a wedding they happened to run out of wine, and he happened to be asked by his mother, hey, can you do something about this? And of course, we know what transpired in the account. So the reason we think there's a lot more to this is because it, at just when you read over it, it seems relatively innocuous, but we're gonna dig a little deeper and see if we can come out with some hidden gems that maybe and that I had not considered before, uh, and maybe you likewise. Maybe everyone here has actually considered this in in you know depth, but um, but I hadn't. So there was a little bit of a learning curve on this one for me as well. So let's go ahead and read these twelve verses, uh, and I think Sister Robin, if you have those there, why don't you just read the entire account, all twelve verses, and we'll get that under our hat. John chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were 
there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when the men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. Okay, um, so refreshed. So now everyone has this in their consciousness. Uh, when we start to break it down it, with verse one, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And this is interesting because Cana of Galilee is just kind of really, scripturally speaking, it's just not that important. You know, it's not a, it's not Jerusalem, you know, it's not Capernaum, uh, it's Cana. And we know other things from the previous scriptures that uh, that's where Nathaniel was from. And that ostensibly is, seems to be about where Jesus and his family along natural lines were from or very familiar with that area because of course, Mary is at this wedding and she's privileged to know that the wine had basically run out or was running out. And there was kind of big trouble in little Cana here that um, the bridegroom and their family were risking some, uh, I'll say loss of uh, favor or loss of uh, reputation in this whole thing. So, uh, and just the very fact that Mary was privileged to this, it seemed to, to indicate that uh, she's well entrenched as far as, uh, or familiar or their, their close family or even you know related in some kind of way that she's a, a part of these wedding plans, if you wanted to call it that. Uh, but let's fixate for a moment on the third day. Any thoughts on, A, why is this brought out, the third day? And then the third day from what? Any thoughts on that? Anybody, anybody, anybody? So if we go back to the previous chapter, Brother Ken, you have a thought? Well, in the comments, it, uh, Brother Russell brings out that it's the third day from the calling of Nathaniel, if, if that's correct, and then that there might be a correlation to uh, that uh, the marriage of the Lamb will be in the third uh, thousand year day of her existence. The marriage of the Lamb will be in the third thousand year day of her existence as the body of Christ and in the seventh of the world's history. Okay. So. Um, you know, when we get through, if we go back to the first chapter of John uh, and we get into um, Jesus is baptized, that's where Jesus is baptized. And we have the account of Jesus baptism with John the Baptist as well. Uh, and this after Jesus returns. So this is a fairly um, quick time period between Jesus returning from the wilderness and the calling of the first handful of disciples. So we've got Andrew and we've got Peter and we've got uh, Nathaniel and a couple of others and they're uh, part of the entourage now. And Nathaniel is kind of an unusual character in that um, his conversion, I'll say, is a, is a little bit funny because when Jesus says, behold an Israelite in whom is no guile, uh, Nathaniel's like, I'm sorry, do I know you? You know, and Jesus said, um, I saw you under the fig tree. And we're not privileged to know what that 
what happened with Nathaniel under that fig tree, but apparently it had to have been something uh, pretty um, unusual and something private to Nathaniel that Jesus, when he said that, it, it just completely blew Nathaniel away. That, um, so there's something there, and there's also something here in the Cana wedding account that we have to kind of fill in the blanks and which is subject to error. So we have to admit that it, when you read through this account and you read whether it's the pastor's comments, other brethren, other commentaries and writers and things like that, you see there's kind of a pantheon a bit of, of uh, different thinking as to what happened and how things took place. Because when we get to, and we're jumping around a little bit, and we'll get back on track in a moment. When we get to Jesus, uh, Mary coming to Jesus, and and telling him they have no wine and then jesus says what do you want me to do you know what do you what do you expect me to do about it it's kind of it now it may have been in that vein or it may have been but something happens that we're not privileged to see because immediately she says whatever he tells you to do just do it that's her response to the, the servants at the wedding whatever my son tells you whatever he says just go ahead and do it no matter what it sounds like and so something happened that we're not apprised of directly here. And some of you may have a, a good idea or some good thoughts on that, on uh, what it was that Jesus said and how he said it, that Mary immediately just assumed, okay, it's in good hands. Jesus will take care of it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. So that's something we can discuss in a moment. But this third day uh, we see in the first chapter, uh, where it talks about Jesus calling the disciples the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and he calls them and then the following day Jesus goes forth into Galilee and finds Philip um, so we see and now we're, we're coming to in this verse and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and there the mother of Jesus was there so um, this third day seems to be after these other two days that are noted. You know, we've got this day, we've got, and the next day, and now we've got, and the third day. So, um, Brother Vivian. Yeah, just a question I thought I'd pose when we're talking about this third day. Um, in Exodus 19, um, when we look at this account of the Moses on Mount Sinai, um, in 19, Exodus 19, verse 8, they say, the nation of Israel says, we will do whatever the Lord says, and that is on the third day as well. Okay. And here now, in this case, Mary, you know, on the third day is saying, do whatever he says, or you should do whatever he tells you. So, I don't know if there's a connection there, and brother, don't have any thoughts. Okay. Uh, Sister Kathy Brooks. Yes, I would think the third day, uh, he is going to show himself now with this miracle and things. He, he's being shown, and, and he's saying to Mary, it's, it's God's appointed time, not yours. And so he's doing a miracle, his first miracle during that time. Maybe third day after his baptism, uh, and then goes into the, for 40 nights, uh, no, that wouldn't be. But anyway, I'd have to rethink that third day because uh, there's so many third days in the Bible. But I think it's his showing. Now he's showing himself, and that's why he says that to Mary. It's not her choice. It's God's. Okay. So, good point. Sister Robin? Some of the translations for verse 1 say, two days later there was a wedding. And so it seems to be indicate that it would be three day or on the third day after the call of Nathaniel, like you said, but it seems odd to me that they would run out of wine on the first day of a wedding feast. I think that the these wedding feasts, if I remember correctly, they were days long. So it would seem more plausible to me that maybe on the third day of the wedding feast is when they ran out of wine, but I have no idea. Over. Okay. Sister, uh, Kathy Sandridge. Well, I, I don't know 
what the significance of the third day is, but you mentioned Nathaniel. And it's interesting that Nathaniel was called in John chapter one. <clears throat> and when you look at the other gospels, there are miracles that Jesus performed, such as uh, in Matthew chapter five, the first miracle that was performed there I think, no, it wasn't the Beatitudes, it was something else. But in Mark chapter 1, we read how Jesus cured Peter's mother. In Luke chapter 4, the first miracle that is recorded is how Jesus casted out demons. And what went through my mind is that for all of these miracles that Jesus uh, performed early on in his ministry, Nathaniel was there. And that's something that I hadn't really considered. Uh, Matthew was not, because he was a tax collector and he was chosen a little bit later. But Nathaniel was always there. Thank you. Okay. Um, just very quickly, let's take a quick jaunt over to John chapter 4. Um, near the end, I think it's the last, uh, let's see, 46 through 54. We won't actually read them. We'll just uh, summarize them because most of you are familiar. But in this case, this was um, an official's, a no, and the King James calls it a nobleman. Uh, but it was someone of like high ranking, uh, you know, in the kingdom, his son, was sick uh, apparently like unto death like it, his death was was deemed to be imminent and jesus is back in cana again he leaves cana for a little while but he comes back and this nobleman who was from capernaum comes and heard that jesus was in cana makes a trip which is no small jaunt you know to us 20 miles is not a big deal uh, 20 miles on foot over hills and valleys and mountains and things like that, that's an entirely different deal. So it took, even if he was in a chariot, a horse-drawn chariot, it was, a, it was at least, you know, a good full day or more of travel. And we find out in the account that it takes him at least a day. His servants are kind of coming to meet him to let him know that, hey, it's okay, your kid's fine. Uh, but the interesting thing is this miracle is in Cana, uh, again, Jesus is in Cana again, and this one is actually called at the end of the chapter, the second miracle. So if you look at John 454, this again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So the first two miracles Jesus performs, one he does, I'll say remote by remote control, remotely, the second one with the nobleman's son. And this first one at the wedding are both done in, in Cana of Galilee, which is um, peculiar to say. So there's something there. I don't know what the maybe someone has an idea as to if there's a antitype or a picture or something here. If there's something about Cana that is fitting and these first two miracles, one converting water into wine and there's so much more to this first miracle. And the second one is just this nobleman. We're not told um, whether he's a Jew or a Gentile. We're not told any of his situation. There are some, I'll say, uh, traditions, early church traditions on who this was and everything, which uh, uh, seem plausible, I'll say, but we won't go into that since the second miracle is not the subject of our study today. But um, the peculiar thing is miracle number one is is told this is the beginning of miracles and miracle number two we specifically are told this is the second miracle Jesus performed and they're both performed in Cana of Galilee so I don't know if there if any if that triggers any kind of um, thinking uh, about Cana and why the first two miracles were done there um, perhaps it's because we're told in another you know a prophet is not welcome in his own country you know, and that this was Jesus giving the opportunity of the, and this is approaching it from a strictly practical explanation, not a pictorial or a spiritual explanation, but the fact that these two miracles, um, this healing of a dying boy and this, uh, this the 
conversion of the water into wine um, were in part meant to demonstrate who Jesus was and at least make people ask like, oh, well, this Jesus, uh, who we know and we grew up with, he's doing these things. Maybe we should listen a little more, be a little more attentive. Um, but at any rate, any other thoughts on the third day, the marriage and Cana, where these things are happening? Any thoughts on that, which is kind of the first half of verse one? Sister uh, Margaret. When you talked uh, about the prophet is not without honor, except his hometown and in his own household. And it says, and he did not do many miracles there in Nazareth. And that's Cana is close to Nazareth, I think, because of their unbelief. So that confirms what you said. And regarding the third day, you know, there are a lot of third days um, in the Bible, but one that is very prominent is the fact that Jesus was raised on the third day. And, uh, and then, uh, so, in some way, he opened, revived the whole mankind. So it's like secondary application. When he died, he revived, you know, and the, the wine revives your, your vitality. And he revived the life of every human being, our possibility of revival. And then there is also in Hosea, there's another scripture in Hosea, um, hold on, it says, Hosea 6, 2, it talks about God, and after two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will raise us and will live in his presence. So also similar uh, idea. Yeah, and that's kind of why we also included the biblical comments on all these verses, and these are exhaustive, by the way, so if you were to look in your expanded biblical comments or whatever, you'll see they're, they're all in here. I did double paste something in here, so we got a uh, little bit of excess redundant information in there. But uh, Sister Julianne. Well, earlier your brother Vivian mentioned Exodus uh, chapter 19. I think uh, you mentioned verse eight. Um, verse 11 says, so that's uh, Israel at Mount Sinai. And be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. So that was a serious thing. That was something that they were to expect. So I think what Brother Russell says about the third day representing the third thousand year um, makes sense because that's when he's revealed to all the people and they, they are to fear him. Yeah, and I'll say that's the natural, uh, our autonomic response as Bible students is generally to consider the, you know, the antitype, the picture, the whatever. Um, and just before we call on Sister Robin here, let's, we'll try to sort out what I'll call the players in this uh, particular account. This is not a parable. This is actually, let's call it a historical account of things that happen. Not a lot of information is given to us and probably by design. So we're meant to use the information that's given to us to ferret out, you know, what it is about this particular event that is so remarkable for a first miracle that essentially establishes Jesus as who he actually is. And that's the uh, amazing thing is that it's done and it's almost done in secret because we've got, of course, we have Cana, which is in Galilee. We have a wedding that's going on. So we have a bride and a bridegroom, but only the bridegroom is mentioned. The bride is not mentioned in the parable. Uh, of course, we have Jesus, we have Mary, and we have uh, the banquet master or the banquet uh, ruler, master, uh, banquet, uh, whatever you want to call him. Yeah, master of ceremonies. What did you say, Sister Julian? Governor. Governor. 
Um, and we have the servants that are doling out the, uh, you know, responsible for uh, dealing the, the food and the wine. And then ultimately we have the disciples that are mentioned at the end uh, and his mother and his brethren and his, uh, because of the disciples and his brethren are mentioned separately, his brethren would be his natural uh, family members in this particular case. So, so again, we've got Jesus, Mary, a bridegroom, a governor, disciples, uh, his brethren, his family members, um, and, uh, and that's pretty much it, but we want to kind of keep them straight. Uh, Sister Robin. Yeah, just in looking at the Strong's word for Cana, you know, you kind of have to back back through a few layers, you know, it's a reed or the place of reeds, but when you back through to the Hebrew root, um, and it's uh, Hebrew strong 7069, it means to get, acquire, create, buy, possess, and one of the sub definitions is of God originating, creating, redeeming his people. So it's interesting. <laughs> Christ's redemption work begins in Cana, which means redeem in, in one of the definitions. Over. Okay. Uh, so very good. Good, because I think that factors into it as we move along with regard to what Cana means. Uh, so all these things are, you know, these details are specifically provided to us in Scripture for us to uh you know be able to use to decipher it's not it's nice that there was a wedding and it's nice that jesus took care of the wine problem but i'll say the actual event that took place is probably woefully uh insignificant by com by comparison to what the either the antitype or the lesson we're supposed to get out of it so there's a lesson here, I think, for us in the here and now, especially, and we'll get into that as we as we move on. So any other thoughts or comments? Again, three days, Cana, before we get into the exchange between Jesus and his mother. All right. So verse two, uh, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Uh, and we were already told Mary was already there. Jesus' mother was already there. So Jesus and his disciples were invited to come to the wedding. And probably because A, Nathaniel was a resident of Cana. So in all likelihood had friends, family, whatever the case is. And so, but also Jesus and, you know, because Mary and Jesus likely as well uh, were invited to the wedding. And those disciples that Jesus had just recently called within the last few days uh, came along with. So they were his plus ones, if you wanted to call it that. Uh, any thought in particular on the mother of Jesus was there and Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage? Now, it doesn't, you could, could probably get the wrong idea that he was called just to fix a problem, but no, he was invited to be an attendee at the marriage festivities. So any thoughts on those verses or just let them lie as they are? Okay, um, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, now, when who wanted wine? That's the, what's that? The guests. And it, if you read it in the King James, it's also possible that, you know, both Jesus, so we don't have a record in particular of Jesus or even the disciples uh, drinking wine at this. Not that they wouldn't have, and they likely would have, but it's not something that, you know, it's not, it has, I, I think it's probably important for us to uh, completely, in a sense, disregard the propriety of drinking wine or whether or not Jesus and the disciples drank wine at this wedding. I don't think that is one bit consequential to the account. So we're just going to shelve that. Let's see. You can have that your opinion on that for another day. It doesn't impact or affect this lesson whatsoever. And as a matter of fact, if you look, uh, uh, and I kind of got that remark from the pastor, so I'm, I'm uh, being a plagiarist here. 
um, that he essentially says, you know, it has zero to do with, uh, and remember back in the pastor's day, the temperance movement was a big deal. That was a big thing. So he was saying this doesn't have anything to do with anything about temperance or alcohol or anything. It's, you know, put that out of your head. If anything, it's a distraction and probably uh, counterproductive to ferreting out the deeper intent of this account, Sister Karen. Well, the word wanted has many different definitions. And one, if something is wanting, it means it's not there. And in the God's Word translation, it says, and when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they're out of wine. So it's not that, it just could just mean that there was no wine left and that's why she went to him. Not that they were like all clamoring for their wine. Yeah, okay. Any other thoughts? Yes. And I kind of, can I comment on verse four? Uh, I guess we're about there. So yeah, okay. if you want to. It's interesting, you know, some of, some of the other versions say, you know, why are you telling me this or that's not my business or, or whatever. Um, it's, he tells her that, but he must have given her a look as well of resignation or something because she immediately says, go do whatever he tells you. So she didn't, the words that he says and her actions are different over. Yeah, it is a little peculiar. And this is where you can debate the spirit or the way uh, or what happened in which Jesus, you know, said this to his mother. Because if you read the King James, uh, you know, the, the, our English speaking brains convert this statement into something that seems kind of curt, seems kind of, uh, you know, like dismissive or kind of like, you know, that's not my problem. Go ahead. And I don't think that any of us necessarily really think uh, that uh, along those lines, but uh, there's probably, again, more to it. And we can dig in, uh, you know, peel back some layers on that and see if we can get some maybe a consensus view of this exchange personally between Jesus and Mary and um, how it actually happened and what the intent was behind it. Uh, Kathy Sandridge and then I think Brother Jeff. Well, um, the first thing that went through my mind is why would Mary even ask Jesus about their, their not having wine if he hadn't performed any miracles. That's just what went through my mind. I don't have an answer for that. But if he hadn't performed any miracles, why would she approach him? That's thought I had. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can't uh, certainly prove it, but I don't think Mary had a miracle like this in mind when she was asking Jesus. I think it was more like, hey, uh, and, I, and I don't want to trivialize it or put it in this regard, but it's kind of like, um, you know, Jesus was a 30 year old man at this time. And it was, uh, and he had, uh, you know, followers now, disciples, whatever. So uh, she probably felt that there's certainly something. So I, I hesitate and I don't want to say it, you know, because it's a margin call you want to say that from my perspective but i hesitate to think that she was actually requesting a legitimate miracle more that she was like hey we're out of wine we need you know can you do something about it and i don't think again this is another margin call i don't think jesus went to this wedding expecting to perform a miracle or this miracle i think what happened is and again this is just my personal thinking on it and it's comes from uh, some of the pastor's comments and some of uh, brethren have given discourses at various conventions over the years. And um, I, I like some of the ideas. So I've been cherry picking different things. So very little of this is original to me, uh, but I think it was Jesus saw this initially as, well, what do you, you know, I'm not sure what you think I can do about this or what you expect me to do about this. And after perhaps a short period of time, he realized, well, the, you know, my heavenly father has put me in this situation to 
do something. So he, he saw it as an opportunity by the Heavenly Father rather than something pre-scripted or pre-planned or foreknown by Jesus that he was going to go into this wedding and do this thing, you know, perform this miracle. That I didn't think he went, I don't think he went into the wedding thinking, oh, this is my first, this is first miracle time, you know, uh, uh, Sister Kathy and then Brother Jeff, because I think she wants to amplify on what she was saying. Yeah, I, I don't think he went to the wedding thinking he would perform a miracle either. It's just interesting in verse five, Mary told the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. So the point is, is that Mary had confidence that Jesus would resolve the issue about the wine. Thank yeah. you. Mary had the confidence and also it shows that she was involved at an integral level in this, uh, this uh, the whole marriage affair. So that was probably family that she was involved with and she was there, you know, to uh, uh, in a let's call it an administrative role more than just attending uh, brother Jeff and then sister Kathy Brooks and then brother Ken. Um, and then, so, and then sister Julie. Uh, suggested comments in uh, brother Frank Chalou's uh, uh, studies, you know, that um, by the way, I've plagiarized some of those thoughts too. Oh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't see any in your in your uh, write up, but yeah. uh, from there, but it's on. Okay, um, is it on? Can you hear me? Okay, all right. Um, it would. Uh, he he's suggesting he's not. Jesus would not prepare to start his miracles yet, and when it when the time came, it would be at uh, his father's bidding, not his mother's. Um, and then he also suggested he wanted more of the disciples with him at the beginning of the miracles, and so far there were only five. Um, so that's, um, and he also, he also made a suggestion about the drinking of wine in, a, in the, the marriage of the church, you know, as a, another possibility that. that yeah, and some of those will come out once we start getting into the six containers and all that kind of stuff, so. Uh, Kathy Brooks. When Jesus fed either the 4,000 or the 5,000, he knew what he was going to do. Oh, give them what you have. You have five loaves, two fishes, you know, feed them. Well, he knew he was going to change that to make enough for everybody. So I think he he knew that I, I don't think he was surprised at anything he was going to do. I think he knew when he went to, went there that he would perform his first miracle. Just saying. Yeah, and that's again, this is all just us filling in blanks that are intentionally left blank. So those are the things we can get into a little bit, round out the account for us, but we don't we just don't have the, you know, we have what's written, it's in 12 verses. So, uh, and you could very well be right that Jesus went to the, you know, before he even went to the wedding, he fully expected to perform this miracle. I, it's not something I would, I would even, you know, discuss that's entirely plausible as well. So, uh, let's see. So I'm going to do Sister Julianne, because you've actually had your hand up for a while, then Brother Ken, and then I think uh, Sister Sony. So to go along with all the, the thoughts, I think we were all on the same page. Um, I like also what uh, the commentary Jameson Fawcett Brown says, um, woman, what have I do with thee? Uh, in my father's business, I have to do with him only. It was a gentle rebuke for officious interference entering a region from which all creatures were excluded. Uh, Acts 4.19, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. So I think that was a good reminder for, for all, and that my hour is not yet calm, hinting that he would do something, but at his own time, and so she understood it. So that, that was just a, a wonderful way to see that, you know, it's not about hearkening to you. Yes, there's, there are things to do, and uh, I received my command from God, and don't worry, I will deal with those things. 
Okay, Brother Ken. Well, just kind of considering the thought of why Mary would have asked him and, and the thought that was brought out by the pastor that uh, she had learned to rely on him. <clears throat> and he was a 30 year old man. If you go back to Luke 2:49, when Jesus was 13 and they were looking for him in, in, the, in the temple and they couldn't find him. And in 49, it says, and he said unto them, how is it that you sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spoke unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. So I think that involvement we see from 13. And then in, in uh, Luke 2.52 it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So she would, I think as he became perfect as a man of 30, she probably would have had much reliance on Yep, good thoughts. Uh, Sony. Yeah, since Brother Keen already gave the scriptures that I was uh, going to give, but I, I do have one more. Um, when uh, Jesus was born, the shepherds went there and, and they, um, they said a few words and it says at the end of that that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. So again, he brings up Luke uh, the second chapter, verse 52, and it says that she kept all these things um, uh, in her heart, all these things in her heart. So I'm going a little bit different. I'm going to say Jesus did not know what he was going to do. But I, I read it from a different version. Uh, in, in the BBE, it says uh, in verse um, 3, uh, when they had not enough wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, this is not your business. My time is not come. St it's still to come. His mother said to the servants, whatsoever he says to you, do it. So we have no idea um, what means that the Lord would allow, the Lord Jehovah would allow his son to begin that first miracle or to start his ministry. Neither do I believe Jesus know when his ministry would start, but that his father would orchestrate those things. So uh, him using Mary in this manner could very well be uh, his, his plans and purposes. I don't see, um, you know, why that wouldn't be the case. She was his mother. She'd uh, been with him, close to him all this time. And he was the one appeared to me that he was uh, close to her as well. So those are my thoughts. Yeah, and I think, my preference, and that's all I can really say it is, is kind of along those lines myself. But again, it's just uh, uh, however the details work out, that's fine. But again, this is, we're told specifically, this is the beginning of his miracles. And it's at a wedding. It's after three days, and whether those three days are after the wedding began, or three days after Nathaniel was called, or three days after he returned from the wilderness. I mean, that um, th that's still up in the air. But the fact of the matter is, you can almost take this this these twelve verses and pull them right out of scripture because they're really unrelated, mostly to kind of anything else. There's not a lot of backstory here. So that tells me in a sense that it's really made uh, to do more than just establish Jesus as the Messiah. That, it, that was the original intent when it happened. But for us now, we don't, you know, that's, it's just another miracle. Now, why, when you get into this interaction between he and Mary, you know, and what do, what do these things represent, if anything? And I do think, you know, there's something there for us, especially when we get a little deeper into it. But um, Mary tells, you know, if we're going to put this into a picture or into a type antitype type of situation, um, we want to try to be as thorough as possible. And that's why we break out the imagery as well as the individuals so again jesus mary bridegroom governor wedding guests disciples and so we've got these people and then we have uh this interaction between jesus and mary and the instruction by mary whatever he tells you to do just go ahead and do it because you imagine this when we get into the meat where we're right about to get into now, because we have about 30 minutes to uh, put
push through this. When we get into the meat of this, we find out there are six hewn water pots. These are not, pot, this is not pottery because there's, a, there's, there's an important aspect to this. These are hewn um, and they're called purification pots or what have you. And there's a reasoning behind that as well. Um, so you've got these six pots and Jesus says, fill them with water. Now, if you're one of the servants, you're like, what's that gonna do for, our, you know, how's that gonna fix our problem? Our problem is wine, not water. We've got plenty of water and plenty of things to hold water in, but it's wine that we need. So, but that's why whatever he says, go ahead and just do whatever he says, no matter what it is, go ahead and do it. And so we get into this scenario now where they're responsible for filling to the brim, very specific instructions, these six pots, very specific number, type, the very specific type of pot that he's filling, that, they're, that he's instructing them to fill. And, and there's from our, and the pastor does bring this out, and I'll just uh, read it very quickly, um, fill it to the brim, and um, they filled them to the brim, and he said unto them, draw out now and bear it to the governor of the feast, and they bear it. So when the pastor brings this out, he says where it says draw out now, he says the change from water to wine being evidently instantaneous, like there wasn't, there's no intervening, um, Jesus doesn't stand up and say a prayer over the wine that's recorded. We're not saying he didn't, he may have, that's okay, um, but it just fill it up, now take it out. <laughs> that was his instruction. Fill to the brim, okay, it's filled to the brim, okay, now take it out and give it to the, the banquet master. So that's exactly what happened. So this, now we're getting into what I think it gives us um, a little bit more of an inclination that this has more to do with just the event and a record of the event to establish that Jesus was the Messiah at this time. And it's more relevant to us even. So again, third day, wedding, six pots, water and wine. And of course then, so I don't know and I don't think we'll have enough time to get into, you know, for us to really turn the afterburners on and get through everything, but uh, Sister Robin. Well, interesting, oh, the six purification pots, first filled with water, then filled with wine, reminds me of two scriptures, Ephesians 5.26, that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, and Revelation 1.5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So that wine could represent his blood and the washing, you know, since they're in the purification pots, the transition of washing by the water of the word to the washing and cleansing through his blood. Over. Okay, all right. Um, who was back there that had a, a sister, Kathy Brooks? <clears throat> I was just going to say that our, the Gospel Age, the wedding starts our Lord's ministry, and also it will start the Millennial Age to another wedding will take place. So it's and interesting that Jesus... Probably the wine, too, no. brother. Probably the wine, too. I'll drink again with you in the kingdom. Yeah. So now we're getting into the crux of the matter that I think is probably where most of us are more interested in how this, uh, how can we draw this into being something bigger than what it is just uh, as it's given in the scriptures. And so we, Sister Kathy brought it out. Uh, Jesus tells us that henceforth, I will not drink this again. Of course, this was at the last supper, what we call the last supper, uh, until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom. And we do know there's gonna be a wedding uh, of Jesus and the bride. And we do know this wine, whatever it is, uh, we don't know exactly, you know, the, but it, that's going to be, it's a celebration. Wine has to do with mirth, M-I-R-T-H. Uh, it has to do with joy. Um, but another interesting thing about wine is, and let's do our little autonomic Bible student response 
thing. Um, wine can also be, in Bible student ease, doctrine. Doctrine. Interestingly, water can also represent truth, the, the word, etc. So we have uh, water being changed into wine in these six uh, hewn, not made, but hewn vessels, uh, purification vessels. Um, Brother Ernie. I'm not quite sure where this is going to go, but yeah. the, sort of the really top level thing sort of appears to me is that the water might represent the truth. It might get put into the church. It might come out as doctrine to basically be spread to the world of mankind and the kingdom might be represented by, you know, by basically the participants in this Jewish wedding. So, I mean, I, I, I kind of see something along those particular lines. And I don't know if that's where you're going or not, but that's sort of an idea that appeals to me. Yeah, I think if you are a compass, you're pointing in the right direction of where we're going with this. So, um, any other thoughts? We, we can, they can be eclectic, that's fine, because uh, it might contribute to our ferreting out more info. Now, in both these things in Cana um, are unusual, in that in most cases, in most miracles Jesus performs, he gives thanks uh, or it's done, you know, it's a, a healing, it's a uh, casting out of demons, it's, you know, whatever the case is. But in both these cases, uh, the one we read or, or touched on briefly in John chapter four, the healing of the nobleman's son, in both these cases, he doesn't do an active thing if you look at it. All he says, is take these pots, fill them with water, and then once they're full, go and, and take some out and give it to the banquet master. And then it, we find it's, it's distributed to the guests. Uh, and it's, it's wine, we're, you know, we're inserting some thinking here, but the banquet master was blown away by this wine and likely the guests were too, that it was of unusual, uh, quality, character, flight, whatever the case was. There's something unusual about this wine that everybody found very, uh, I guess you could say, you know, unusually uh, refreshing or inspiring or whatever the case is. Um, but it's interesting, he just tells them, he says, fill it up, take it out, give it to the banquet master and the guests. The same thing with the second miracle in Cana. When the man comes to him and says, just, you know, can you come back? My son's dying. I really need you. And Jesus says, don't worry about it. It's taken care of. He's already healed. Your son's fine. He lives. And the man believed and went back. And sure enough, his, his uh, servants meet him on the way and say, your son is in perfect health. And of course, there you know, be a little bit more information where it says, he asked, when was it that my son recovered? And they said it was about this time. And he said, and he realized that was exactly the same time that Jesus said, your son's, your son's fine. He's going to live. Don't worry about it. Um, and that was it. That's the only thing we have. But in both of these instances, Jesus, it was like, a, I'll say very soft touch, a very under the table uh, 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 miracle in a sense. And um, so here, and I think we're going to start digging a little more since we've got about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, Brother Vivin. Oh, we do have a hand online. Um, I don't know if we're taking that. Yes, absolutely. It's by uh, Kim. doesn't have a last name. Go ahead. Let me try that. Can you guys hear me now? So I'm muted. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, this is Brother Derek. So I relate this to a couple of things. The third day, you know, the wedding um, and uh, the marriage of the bride and the bridegroom, which is with the church. Also, the 120 
Um, we didn't talk about that. We talked about these six pots, but um, some of the commentaries say firkins, six firkins is uh, equivalent to 20 gallons. So if you look at some of the first, you have the beginning of the law covenant with, with Moses, you know, 40 years in Egypt, 40 years as a shepherd, 40 years um, leading the Israelis, um, the beginning of the Jews into the law covenant. So there's a beginning, there's a first there, 120. And then you have the first three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. Again, the beginning of the kingdom and the reign of um, Israel on the, the world. And the, the fall of that kingdom, again, 120 years. So now we have this 120 gallons at the very first miracle, which I believe Jesus did, um, you know, is his primary focus was to, to cast out demons and heal the sick. It probably wasn't what he had in his mind, but when he, his mother requested this for the consideration of his mother and the love for her, he figured out how he could make this a uh, very prophetic um, event and a miracle, a very first miracle. And again, aren't we looking forward to that wedding um, with our bride, bride and bridegroom, us being the bride uh, as the first part of the uh, resurrection of the saints when they're completed. And then this is interesting because this 120 is also in the upper room when the Holy Spirit was given. The Holy Spirit's given, and there's 120 up there that now have the, the beginning of the church, um, you know, before they were called Christians, um, the work of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So I see it as a very prophetic number, and I also see it as um, very fitting that, you know, as us and other members of today's discussion have mentioned this, this bridegroom class, too, um, as a marriage of the elect 144,000 and the work that we will do for the world of mankind, beginning with the church. Um, and that's pretty much what I was coming up with as I was listening to the discussion. Thank you. Okay. So good thoughts. And I think that again, kind of, uh, pushes us down the, what I think is the right road or the road we're trying to go down on this. And we're going to go ahead and ask, uh, brother Jeff Earl. He's, he's, this is out of the uh, Rockland study notes, which I thought was good. And I think, uh, again, it's, um, it's zeroing in on what seems to be a potential or possible explanation or antitypical or significance for us at this end of the age. Uh, and I think there's even more to it, which we may or may not get into. We probably won't have time, but uh, hopefully this will stimulate some thinking in brethren because I, honestly, I'd almost, I don't want to say forgotten about this, you know, miracle, but it's just not something that you hear much about. It's just kind of, you know, it's in our studies. We know what happened and then we just move on. We never really peeled back the layers on this onion and tried to get to the, you know, the juicy core in the middle here. Uh, not that there's a juicy core in an onion, but uh, brother uh, uh, Jeff, if you can read that paragraph for us. Okay, I'm can you hear me okay yeah you might get a little bit closer okay um i'm going to start with a f previous paragraph it's a short paragraph uh it says apparently the water pots were not empty but were in various stages of fullness jesus commanded they be filled up not just to the neck but to the brim then the liquid was drawn out and borne to the steward who was serving the wine um and this is the paragraph you wanted me to read. Uh, Brother Henry Sontag gave a beautiful application to the six water pots uh, su in suggesting that they represented the six volumes of studies in the scriptures. His reasoning was based upon three points. One, the third day, the harvest period. Two, the proximity of the marriage of the Christ. And three, the fact that the water represented represents truth and wine pictures the joys of the truth. Bread and water have been supplied to the church all down the age, even though they were scarce at times. But in the harvest period, that which was truth became exhilarating truth. The present harvest message is not 
just truth, but truth with a ring, sound, and melody it has not had since the first advent. When Jesus said, I will drink the wine anew with you in the kingdom, he was referring not to the wine of suffering, death, and blood, but to the wine of joy. A marriage was a time of joy. The wine goes beyond the memorial to the kingdom. Okay. So that's, and while on, I'll just say, finer points, personally, I think there's even more to it. But when we go down this line of thinking, um, one of the comments in those study notes was along the lines of that the exuberation and the joy of what was happening at the first advent had been largely lost throughout the gospel age until the time we're in now when the so many uh, of the fundamental truths of the gospel were all but lost and obscured for to the masses for most of the gospel age the very fact that the scriptures themselves were prohibited from the lay people's hands you know was something that uh, only was remedied back in the really the 17 and 1800s you know when we talk about as bible students talk about the bible societies and when you look at the proliferation when the scriptures became readily available uh, to uh the average person again of commentaries and things like that so when you take into account not just um, what I can, you know, my, and I'll just share my own personal and synopsis of how I, I view what we call the present truth movement is, and I do see the pastor as being the, mess, the, the final messenger to the church and the flesh on this side of the veil. That's my own personal opinion, whether, you know, it doesn't matter whether uh, people agree, you know, to me, it doesn't, I don't think it affects anything necessarily, but what came back was a renewed vigor and appreciation of uh, first advent truths that basically didn't exist we always had the water as it were that's always been there and it's it don't forget it's dispensed by servants to first the banquet master let's call it or governor or whatever you want to say but ultimately it is dispensed you know for a for like approval of sorts and he gives his resounding approval of this you know this wine is amazing you've res this is you saved the best for last you know we have that expression the be we saved the best for last well in this particular event the banquet master says exactly that you here most people give the best first you save the best for last this is amazing go ahead and give it out to all the guests. So the, the banquet master doesn't give it, but he does direct the servants to dispense from these six purification vessels to all of the attendants or attendees at the wedding, um, who I should say really gathered for the wedding. Because as far as I know, please correct me if I'm wrong, they weren't married and then had a feast. They had a feast and that was all, the marriage was part of this big feast arrangement. And then the bride and the bridegroom would go off and start their lives together after the festivities were over. So it's at the time of festivities, it's at the time when you know it's dispensed by servants, it's dispensed out of these six vessels um the six vessels may have something also to do with timing uh which i think they do i won't get into that but because that's my own very personal opinion on this matter so i don't want to uh diffuse things by introducing thoughts that i i don't think most are you know have had time to contemplate but um but so in the light of this thinking and what was brought out by brother sontag and by others uh, is it are synapses firing with anyone? Does anyone have any thoughts they'd like to contribute along these lines, Sister Margaret? So that uh, abundance of um, wine would transfer to the whole mankind. And I would like to quote Amos uh, 9 and 13. 
Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the trader of gra grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And then and it says, you know, that I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel. Um, and they shall build and the cities and whatever, the vineyards. So it will be sweet wine. So there will be blessings uh, that of that of that uh, the the action of transfer of um, converting truth into water into wine and uh, it will spill to the whole mankind um, i like the idea that it, it really at the end of the age we we do have the beauties of the truth more than the others we can see the plan of god more clearly than before thank you good thoughts um anybody else uh sister julianne so when we look, look at uh, the vessels the stone vessels of water um they were actually for purification purposes uh, so they were holding the water, and uh, Sister Robin mentioned it earlier about, you know, the water and the blood, how we're washed by the water and the blood. Um, and in the Proverbs 4, 20 and 22, you know, my son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my saying, let them not depart from thy eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. So Jesus, as Logos, he was also the word or the spokesman of God. So, so his word, verse 22, they are life unto uh, those that find them and health to all their flesh. Um, so the water and the blood, it's like being the life of the world and also the health of the world. Okay. And also we, we see that from uh, Timothy, when Timothy was suffering from a uh, digestive issue, Paul said, add to your water a little bit of wine, and it will, it will help with your uh, health issue. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know if the water was in there, but okay. Um, but uh, all right, um, other thoughts? We have about 10 minutes of actual discussion time here. Sister Kathy Sandridge. Yeah, um, I have thought about who the ruler of the feast could typify, and I just so happened to look at your notes from the expanded comments, and I thought it would be God, and I think the expanded comments said it would be God. And the bridegroom, I reason would be not only Jesus, but the Christ, and the men who partook of the um, wine after the bride, the rule of the feast and after the bridegroom, the men could possibly picture the human family. But I do find it interesting that the wine that was served was only for the men at the wedding. Thank you. Okay. Um... All right, I don't know if that's either consequential or if that's actually in the account to have to, if it was just, you know, the women were allowed to drink the wine. I don't know that, I don't know. It's, it says men, maybe it was men and women. Okay. Okay. But, and uh, when men have well drunk, yeah, okay. So, um, okay, yeah, I think that's like a general, uh, like mankind uh, type of thing. But, um, uh, okay, other thoughts, uh, Brother Ken. I see wheels turning. Well, I wonder if there's any uh, significance in the vessels being for the purification, the purification oh. of the Jews. I'm betting there is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and that's the interesting, so you have six, right? Which typically, if we look at other things, remember, um, 
uh, la- the rich man who has five brothers, you know, that, and we typically send, or, or send, we typically say that that represents the nation of Israel, you know, and we have six here, and uh, let's call it two firkins each, which is 12, you know, firkins, which I think the brother uh, that mentioned, you know, turns out to be 120, so a uh, firkin, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is like 10 or whatever, uh, 10, 10, or 10 whatever in a firkin. Uh, it's just a weird word for me to say, firkin. But um, uh, so, uh, and I'm not really, I didn't, I looked a little bit, but there seems to be no general consensus on the, the idea behind a firkin, but I'm sure it's, spe- it's mentioned. Um, so, I, so this idea behind it, of it being relevant and it having a mathematical component that we can p- possibly interject into the account for our antitypical you know, line of thinking, um, makes perfect sense to me. What it is doesn't make perfect sense, but you know that it represents something does. Um, so maybe the 120 or other things. But the purification jars, we got six of them, filled with water, ostensibly pure water. And these jars, the reason that they're called purification jars is that because they're hewn from hard stone, they don't, they aren't easily defiled or they don't take on the properties of whatever's put inside them. So they'll remain uh, pure, the stone will remain pure regardless of what you put inside of the jar. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take on like a, a piece of pottery, on the other hand, can absorb and take on the, you know, the, the flavor, or the color, or the tech, whatever of whatever you put inside of it. But these would remain, you know, uh, relatively clean and would be easy also to clean out. So, um, so then, so they're full, they're full as we of water, which, and as soon as they dip something in, ostensibly you'd think probably some sort of uh, uh, vase or flask or something, they dip it in and pull it out and boom, it's wine. And not only is it wine, it's the best wine ever. Uh, and it's given to the governor, which maybe that's Jehovah, maybe the bridegroom is Jesus. I don't know, because Jesus it, it is here in this picture as well as Jesus and Mary is in this picture. Does Mary have a counterpart? Um, do the disciples have a counterpart? I do think it's interesting that the servants who are just told what to do and they do that, they, they take out and they start serving people from the, the wine from these six pots, they start serving. So um, that I don't, you know, I don't know if there's a I, well, I shouldn't say I don't know. I'm reasonably certain there is a counterpart. What is that counterpart? So I'll, I'll just throw this out there for your consideration because we've got, you know, five minutes. So I'll just say, does Mary have uh, in a picture, does, is there a Mary component to this at the end of the age? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that's just to set the stage. Uh, the interaction between Jesus and Mary, is there a something to that more than just what happened here in the actual account. Um, the six pots, you know, what are they? Are they volumes? Are they time? Are they time and volumes? Are they whatever? I mean, that's, uh, are they something else? You know, what is the, the thing with the six? And then it starts out as water, it becomes wine. The governor, uh, the bridegroom, the, uh, the wedding guests, the, uh, the disciples, the, and finally the servants that serve the wine to all of the guests after the governor says, serve the wine to everybody. This is fantastic stuff. Everybody should have some of this, you know, serve it. Um, so that I think in a nutshell is, is what we would throw out there for additional consideration from others. If, if like I said, synapses start firing, Holy Spirit starts turning light bulbs on in your head. But somebody had, uh, uh, Britt. Well, I have a... So when Jesus was on the cross, um, Mary Mary was there too, and then Jesus also said, "Dear women, here is your son." So that's kind of kind of similar to "Dear women, not our problem." And uh, and I'm just throwing this out there. So maybe Jesus is the seventh vessel. So maybe the six plus Jesus, because seven is kind of um, re- represents perfection. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Okay. Uh, Brother Ken, Sister Sony, and then Sister, wow, and more. <laughs> we're going to have to be really, so we're going to cap everybody at uh, 
30 to 45 seconds. So Brother Ken, go. <laughs> well, well, it's interesting that when uh, Jesus was asked who his mother was, he yeah, was told that his mother was outside and he said, who is my mother? This is my mother and, and, and my brothers. And, he, and it seems to be he was inferring to the Sarah covenant and the covenant that uh, would be with him. And so it would be at a certain time that his mother would ask him and he says, my time has not yet come. But then is, is there would be a certain period that this uh, would be a finality. And so if that's true and the wine is turned into the truth or the water's turned in, the truth is filled up in the pots, then maybe the governor could be uh, the seventh messenger and that the six pots would be given to him and then dispersed, but it would be given by Jesus through uh, prophecy and knowing that it was time. Yeah, and of course, you know, he calls the, he calls the bridegroom, the governor, you know, he says the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. So he tells the bridegroom, hey, come here. And then they have this exchange. Uh, there is one other thing, and you had mentioned it with regard to, um, you know, Jesus' interaction with Mary, uh, and not to belabor it because, you know, we're super limited time, but uh, the interesting thing about that is, is when Jesus says here, my hour is not yet come, this is why I don't think, this is just me, I don't think this has to do with the completion of the church and the harvest per se, because this is not Jesus' time. He says specifically, he, he brings out, my, this is not my time. And we do, I think, uh, it's very clear that Jesus' life during his first advent is almost a, especially the last week, but I think the, as a whole, it's very much like Elijah in the flesh where it is a progressive, you know, almost really kind of sequential picture so this is happens very early but it, yet in his first advent so the same thing i would say this event would occur very if there is an antitypical or or pictorial fulfillment i would say this this antitypical aspect happens very early in the second advent that would be my you know my thinking along those lines but uh, that's just to, to throw out there for uh, but we had, um, wait, uh, Sony, Kathy, Robin, 30 seconds. Okay, my 30 seconds. So suppose it had nothing to do with anything that we- Yeah, that's true too, about. yeah. So, <laughs> just throw that out there. So, um, uh, the lack of wine, we didn't talk about what the lack of wine represents. I know um, normally in Judaism, that's considered a spiritual bankruptcy on the on the part of the Jews when there's a lack of wine and wine represents abundance so when he fills the pot truth is there but he mixes it with wine which represents of his blood so in, in my opinion first natural being spiritual so this is the opening of of his ministry to the Jews in my opinion it's just the way I see it yeah. and not all the disciples were there and complete only a handful were there at the time. So, I mean, there are a lot of different facets here that should provoke thought as far as the, you know, timing and how does this fit. And like Sister Sony said, don't get so wrapped up in, we got to make this fit that you start pulling out the sledgehammer and trying to bang a round peg into a square hole. That's our, you know, we do that all the time. You know, we're like, this has to fit, you know, we've got to get it in there somehow. And so we start making, you know, pulling all kinds of craziness out of the ether to make things happen. So we'll try to keep it in that perspective. Uh, Sister Kathy. And yeah, Sister I'll Ryan. be really fast. Uh, yeah. You had mentioned about uh, whether or not there was a type for Mary, whether or not she pictures something. And the only thing I would say is that in John 2.12, I am, would be hesitant to try and make types of things because we know that after Jesus performed the miracle, he left uh, the wedding with his mother, his brethren and his disciples and his brethren, I assume, are his, were his siblings. And so, you know, trying to make a type for Mary and the siblings and for the disciples, it's a lot for me. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sister Robin. Just, to, you know, to tie in kind of with what Britt said, um, the, the six hewn vessels, the seventh hewn vessel is the tomb of Jer Joseph of Arimathea that Jesus was in for the ultimate purification of the world. So, yeah. Over. Or you can look at it as uh, there's a rock that's hewn 
without hands from out of the mountain. And it, but anyway, we won't get into that. 